So welcome everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Really lovely to be here. Uh, it's been a couple weeks for me, so it's it's really, um, yeah, it's a feeling of uh, being able to come home to practice the Dharma together and kind of just be connected in this way. I pre-chose our topic for tonight and I have to say like three hours ago, I was like, I'm not feeling it. Um, which probably means it's exactly what we should be working with tonight, or at least exactly what I should be working with tonight. Uh, we will be uh, looking at just probably for one night only, maybe I'll bring it back one more time. Some of you might have seen, I know on online this can be really far away, but this is the Book of Joy, which Archbishop Desen Tutu and His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and um, it is it's such an inspiring read it's very sweet it's very light uh, for many folks it might not be anything that new but it felt like a, a nice topic to to dip into um, for this evening i'll be honest i am hoping to kind of use some of our discussion as inspiration i'm really fortunate that there's a new um, set of events celebrating this book and celebrating the theme it's going to be a summit of joy in the fall, and I'll be giving, um, moderating a talk with Sokni Rinpoche, and we are supposed to be pulling from themes from the book, so I was like, oh, let's bring in my experts, and we can all talk about this a bit together. So, yeah, that's our plan for this evening, and we are here in the Dharma Collective. I know we have at least two new people. Welcome. And yeah, really delighted to have our um, community online and in person. The Dharma Collective, as maybe some of you know, and it's always wonderful to remember, is a completely volunteer-run space. It, everything that we are experiencing here is the result of generosity. It's nice. It's such a different feeling than almost any space you can go into in the city, right? Where, you know, there's a transactional relationship and usually it works pretty well but this is really a space of generosity not only is it a space of generosity but one thing i really want to emphasize is each of our presence here is also part of that gift because showing up together to you know be with these teachings to go inward and reflect and to think and connect and consider how do we bring these teachings into the world all of it is the practice. So I couldn't come here and just talk to this room alone and it'd be of any benefit to anyone, including myself. So I just really, truly appreciate you all being here and showing up for these teachings and feel really um, fortunate that we get this kind of amazing space, almost feels like an island uh, lost in the middle of the big sea here. And yeah, look forward to our practice. So we'll do about a 30 minute sit together. There will be a bit of a focus on joy. So using a visualization practice, and then we'll go into some of the themes that come up in this book. And I will be open and asking for you all to engage with those themes and topics. Um, before we go any further, <clears throat> just a reminder that um, for those in the space physically and, and those at home, really find a posture that can support you um, even more so at home like it's so great that you are in your home that means you can really find a way your body is at ease we have blankets we have pillows there's like enough room even to lie down if that's going to support your practice and as also preparation for our posture you know consider as much as possible allowing yourself to fully arrive here. That might mean turning off a cell phone that would ring. And for those of you on the screen, maybe you want to turn away from the screen a bit, just giving yourself some space there. If it feels comfortable, you can consider closing your eyes.
and then doing a little calibration of our posture before we begin. Noticing where the spine is lifting from the sacrum. Yeah, we have some good jams coming in here, making sure we can still hear the sounds around us. So maybe we want to just gently shift to the left and then shift over to the right and shift forward and then find a settled posture where our spine has a sense of being upright with a sense of vigilance to our senses and what's around us. Find a place for the hands to be comfortable. That could be resting in the lap, open or closed or folded together. And inviting the head to be gently resting evenly on top of the neck. Not sloping too far forward or back. Let's begin by taking a moment to situate ourselves in this place and in this space. For those of us in the center, maybe noticing the subtle and not so subtle sounds around us. And for those at home, Maybe you've been in the same room or the same chair for a couple hours, but heighten and fresh your senses to the feeling of being right where you are. The walls above you, the floor below. And although we are inside, Feel or imagine a sense of the space just outside, getting close to the setting sun. Here in San Francisco, a warm day. Imagining the sky and the clouds and the sun. And then gently regathering our attention in the space of the body. even amid the subtle movements within the body. Connect to the sense of stillness of the body, settling into its natural state.
mm, to help us settle our inner speech. We can connect to the breath, imagining through our inhale or inviting a clarity, a vividness. And through our exhale, feeling a sense of ease and relaxation. Inhaling, brightly noticing the sensations of breath traveling in through the nostrils. And then exhaling, releasing the brightness and finding ease through the whole body. With our focus on the breath, of course, the mind will wander away and get caught up. Ideas and planning, fixations of many sorts. And consider just how gently and how precisely we can bring our mind back. Retracing that sense of vividness through the inhale and ease through the exhale. still connected with our breath, we invite a sense of openness and spaciousness, allowing the mind to settle in that natural state. So leaning back in our mind, not being quite so caught up in each thought that arises. Extending and expanding ourselves to the limitlessness of our own awareness.
now that we've spent a bit of time settling our body, speech, and mind into their natural states, let's consider our intention for being here. First, let's consider an intention that might meet us tonight. Maybe we come for a specific reason to join together in these teachings and practice. Giving ourselves a clear word or phrase can really help lighten up that motivation, that aspiration. Consider if there's a broader, a wider intention that's also here. Maybe not just the one that feels more resonant tonight, but something underlying, something which speaks to our values, our purpose. Again, allowing ourselves to turn towards this letting it provide us warmth and light, guidance. Allow the intention or motivation to gently recede as though we were turning away from the warmth of the sun, still feeling it behind us, but returning our attention to following the breath. ever so gently shifting the focus of our attention and awareness away from the breath, the body, 
and instead to the mind, memory, imagination. Going to bring to mind a time in which we felt a sense of joy, a sense of delight or happiness. This could be something quite simple, a morning cup of coffee or tea before everything starts, a sense of peace and presence. This could be something more profound, showing up and being able to be of service in one way or another for someone who really needs it. The joy of connection with a beloved being. The joy of connection with this natural world around us. Take a moment and choose just one memory, allowing it to really saturate your attention and awareness. Bringing forth the details and noticing shifts and changes in the body. It's okay if the image is a bit fuzzy or dull. Just really try to recall the experience itself. And again, noticing how bringing forth this memory may shift or change in the body. while holding and embodying a sense of joy. Consider if there's someone in your life who could really benefit from this joy, someone you'd just like to share this with. And using our breath, we'll inhale and connect to that embodied sense of joy. And exhale, extend this joy as though a wish to this being. Inhale, drawing in, exhale, extending and sharing this sense of joy outward. And a couple more times on the rhythm of your own breath. Releasing the image of this person and noticing once again if anything has shifted or changed in the body as so we have imagined this sharing of joy. Noticing the qualities of sensations maybe through the face and chest and belly. Warm or tingling, heavy. Reconnecting to that sense of joy, which may be present still in the body, 
or maybe we need a refresher, recalling this memory or image of joy. And considering not just this beloved friend, considering sharing joy with every single being you've come in contact with, read about, seen, heard from just in the last week, bringing these beings to mind, faces and names if you know them. And once again, with the inhale, connecting to that sense of joy. And exhale, as though giving a gift and inviting a joyful opportunity for each of these beings, extending this out in all directions. Feel or imagine that the more of the joy that you share, the more of the joy that just remains still there with you. Again, inhale, drawing in. And exhale, extending out. One last breath, drawing in and sharing and extending, radiating out. Releasing the image of these beings and simply coming back to this felt experience of being a body of joy. Reconnecting to the inhale and exhale while simply resting in this field all around of cultivated joy. Feel and imagine this possibility that each breath could be a breath of joy. Not covering up or denying other aspects of our life or lived experience, but commingling the sense of joy with whatever else is here.
Thank you for your practice. So I'd love to hear from folks any questions or reflections on that practice. And if folks are talking in this room, I'll repeat it as best I can on the mic. And if folks on the <clears throat> Zoom room want to share anything, do they just raise their hand? Yeah, just raise your hand. Anything you notice? Any resistance to joy, denial of joy, head nodding, being okay. Thank you for sharing that. So <clears throat> it was reflecting that there's some resistance to joy. That might be a difficult area and that empathetic joy, much easier, can connect to that without a problem, this feeling of rejoicing for other people's happiness. But that kind of homegrown, just myself. So I'm curious when you imagined sharing it with others, did that increase your own feeling of joy? So I was, you know, asking if um, sharing the joy with others as we did in that practice, you know, could maybe generate greater feelings of joy and possibly there are others out there who could resonate to that or will receive that. Um, they, they could experience that. Does that, did I get you right on that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else on the practice of kind of, really trying to connect to that sense of inner joy. Sounds simple, but actually not necessarily so simple. Yes, Mace. Yeah. 
Mm. Mm. Yeah. You already have enough. Yeah. Yes. So <laughs> Mace was describing uh, her her resistance to joy um, comes in the flavor of feeling <clears throat> there's so many beings who are suffering. I already have so much. Um, how can I how can I be wanting joy or feeling joy for myself? Yeah. How about our friends online? I feel like I saw something. Oh, there's Claudia. Yeah. Well, I thought about um, a trip that, that I did to uh, the Iwasu Falls in 2019, and it was a lifelong dream for me. Mm. And um, as I was thinking about being right there, um, I had a a flurry of, of emotions because I remember that not only did I have joy, I was exhilarated, I was elated, I was mm. in awe, I was humbled, I was, I mean, by the power of nature and the majestic, mm. I mean, these falls, you know, are, are gigantic, they encompass three different countries, so, I mean, it was incredible, and when you said to uh, uh, share the joy with other people, of course, I thought of people close to me. But then I also de decided to share it with, I always, in most of my practice, practice of meditation, I always think of refugees. I always think of people who are in war. And I, I mean, I had a really deep desire that at least they find little moments of joy. Yeah. And I really, you know, then I, I, I step back and I, I step back from the earth, literally. Like, I think we did something like that with Chandra a couple of weeks ago. And I literally saw the earth and I was mm. blow, blowing the joy to yeah. the earth. You know, to the earth. So it felt wonderful. Um, mm. Yes, I feel I am very fortunate, and there are so many people who are not. But I mean, if this serves any purpose, at least you know, trying to to share a little bit of that with with people, it just I felt it was a wonderful exercise. So thank you. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I. Um... I too also was in nature because I was recently like surrounded by just pure granite mountains and that sense of joy was so easy to connect to and wanting that for other people also felt, um, felt so natural. And yeah, I love that image of, yeah, looking back at the earth and sending the whole earth that joy. It's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or reflections on the practice itself? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. It yeah, yeah. Um, I love that you bring that up. So he's describing that with the joy, like the sadness is also there, almost like a color wheel, right? That they, you know, are complementary. Um, someone just recently gifted me a book called Bittersweet, and it's an examination of that specific emotion of feeling the joy and the sorrow together. I'm only one chapter in, so I can't speak to it, but I, I hadn't even as someone who has spent, you know, all of my professional career studying emotion, I hadn't thought of it as a single emotion. Um, and I do notice for myself with the joy, there can be that sense of sorrow. And for me, it's really grasping. Like, I'm like, no, I, I want that now and forever. Um, I have a sense of sorrow knowing it will end. 
I, I got in the habit for a moment of I had a really hard time even enjoying good things because I would have this anticipation of them ending. It's an interesting phase. It was like following a lot of disruption in my life. And I just knew that things can change so quickly. So even amid the joy, I had this like <gasps> this kind of clinging onto it. And it created, um, yeah, almost like premature loss. So, but I like them just together as, um, yeah, there is a sweetness. I mean, there's a sweetness in sorrow too, right? And I like what you're saying, like, yes, they're far away, but they don't have to be that distant either. Yeah, thanks. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, the, he's describing that there's, in addition to the joy being with the sorrow, there can be a joy that just naturally arises, which is such a delight, but a sense of maybe I, maybe I just kind of cheated my way in here, right? Or somehow someone wasn't looking and I just got in the joy door. Um, yeah, it sounds like a lot of cultural conditioning, right? Of what we're allowed to feel joy for and who deserves joy and and how it happens. And, you know, I have to say, I I didn't think much about the title of this book, the book of joy. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. Like these guys are so hilarious and sweet. And I didn't, I I just, joy is not a word other than empathetic joy that I really think has a lot of room in the Dharma and, um, you know, with empathetic joy, we are really, we're cultivating this, this virtuous quality of the heart by imagining the virtue of others. There's this real like wholesome component. And it's interesting in looking at this book, what they're describing as joy. So I feel like it's like a bit of a rebranding effort um, is what I have learned um, from my teachers as what's called genuine happiness and a sense of that intrinsic flourishing. Alan Wallace talks often of this as eudaimonia. So that's a term, you know, that's coming from Plato of this idea of when we are living in accordance with the virtues of our soul, meaning we're kind of living our values, we're living our purpose. It's different than hedonia, in which the experience that is enjoyable is coming from sensory pleasure, from stimulus, from the outside. But the distinctions are not that binary, um, happily. Uh, And I did appreciate some of the nuance in here, which I'll I'll share a bit. And it's interesting, too, because um, in that context, and so Alan Wallace, some of you know, is um, a root teacher for both Chandra and I. And he's written a lot on this idea of genuine happiness, a book on genuine happiness. It was actually in the running for our group here. We'll see. Um, And in that book, he, you know, really details, especially the four immeasurable practices of loving kindness and empathetic compassion, empathetic joy and equanimity. And he describes that when we can really move towards eudaimonia or the state of genuine happiness, that we're in a mode of kind of cultivation, which he says is distinct from a hunter gatherer mode, which is more one where we're kind of taking from the world versus cultivating, but I am just so, uh, it's interesting because I was writing my notes for tonight and in my own education and learning more about some of the practices of um, indigenous folks in North America, there was cultivation in their hunting gathering. So it's like, and I liked that as a metaphor, right? There's not just one or the other. 
if we were only seeking this so-called genuine happiness, we might end up feeling that I can only feel good if it's, you know, in service of others in this very direct way. And there's a passage in the book where His Holiness the Dalai Lama is enjoying a meal. It's like a delicious, you know, pudding. And um, the interviewer asks, like, it looks like you're getting some joy from that meal. And he's like, oh, yeah, of course. Um, and I'm really clear on why I'm eating. And I'm not eating out of greed. And I know that this food nourishes me to do the work of service in the world. So I can enjoy it. And so I think there's an interesting nuance there. So it's, you know, I can could easily see how we could make that into a way of like letting ourselves off the hook for a lot of stuff. Um, but I think I like the way that he's really connecting to joy because his connection to purpose is so clear. You know, like he has completely saturated his consciousness with this dedication to service for all beings. And so in every way that he interacts with the world, that intention is manifest. And it doesn't have to be like serious and grave. It can be really joyful. I thought that was a really, um, yeah, really beautiful take. Cause I, you know, like a, a lot of folks maybe um, here tonight, you know, I say a blessing um, for the food and of appreciation of gratitude and of, um, you know, dedicating some, some of my own energy towards, uh, what can be gained from this food. And I do, I have to be honest, maybe I am a little solemn about it. And then I have fun and eat. And I like this idea of interweaving those two a bit more, right? Like enjoying the food because of my intention. I don't know, that infusion together, um, I think it's a really nice piece. Um, another, yeah, another, another part I thought was interesting um, in the dis in the distinction here is um, that they're really talking about joy as this form of happiness that goes beyond um, what we can experience just from sensory pleasure. It doesn't prevent us from sensory pleasure. So when I think generally of genuine happiness or this eudaimonia, um, it's often a sense of really having kind of um, an aligned goal and a deeper, I don't know what the right word is, satisfaction with life as it is. And it's a tough one. I mean, I do think even if we get that, you know, if we, if we want to use this idea of Dean as that kind of stolen sense of joy, oof, I didn't earn it, I just got a little sense of joy. And then, you know, we have Mace's conditioning of, oh boy, I can't feel this joy. The world is on fire, right? Um, or my own life is on fire. Like I can't feel joy right now. And I think I shared this with the Sangha. I, I had you guys really shitty six weeks, uh, a little while back there. I, um, lost my beloved kitty. I got COVID. My house got robbed. My dad was in the hospital. I mean, it was like a very hedonically bummer set of weeks. And, um, you know, it was right back to back and reflecting on it, there was so many moments of joy, so many, like amid all of it. And of course I could have denied them and said, oh no, I'm, I'm grieving or I'm, I'm, you know, I'm overwhelmed. And, and that was true sometimes. But when I looked closely, there was a lot of joy happening, a lot of it in community, like rising up to help me laugh. Um, and a lot of it in that kind of that, that both end that color wheel, especially with the grief, right? So the memory of my beloved little cat being um, would bring so much joy right along the sorrow. And, um, you know, that rings true from a lot of the research we see that it isn't just we have this period where things are just totally horrible and it's opaquely horrible. There are these moments of this, what's called a co-occurrence of positive emotion right amid the difficulty. And I wonder if, you know, especially thinking of um, 
Miss Holiness the Dalai Lama. I know Archbishop Desmond Tutu's life a little less. I know he's an extremely powerful political figure, or, or was, the late Desmond Tutu, um, in his standing up against the apartheid, and he witnessed, wow, huge horrors uh, living under the apartheid. And both of these men, in no kind of fake way, are also like beacons of joy. And I, you know, it's really engaging to hear them converse about, you know, they don't even have a right to be morose, right? How, how can you fixate on just one thing and stay there? And one of the ways they talk about a huge obstacle for our joy is self-centeredness. This is obviously classic dharma there, but the self-centeredness both of, you know, because we're so focused on acquisition from the outside, we miss out on these other sources of joy, but also like that we get so focused on our misery, right? And we don't believe that anyone else experiences it, that we actually get in the way of our joy. This really funny phenomena of knowing that, you know, our suffering is shared is actually a source of joy. Very bizarre. And yet, um, again, I, I, that um, core teaching of Buddha of like, come and see and try it on. And I encourage, you know, the, the term I love is the me search of like, how has that been true for you? So I would, yeah, I would, I'd be curious to hear for folks if, if they've had joy and been able to really connect with joy, even as things are kind of on fire. Oh, Diane, I see your hand. Sorry, I missed it before. Oh, I just wanted to read what folks wrote in the chat. Marianne, yes, please. Um, wrote, says that for some reason, I cried the whole meditation while thinking of joy. She cried the whole meditation while thinking of joy. And um, Walt just wrote, I'm in the middle of my wife being back east, visiting my family for three weeks. And in light of that, my joy is ambivalent. I've reflected that I'm so joyful she's in my life that I feel as if I wouldn't want to be alive without her, not clinging mm. or neediness, but imagine gray overcast days forever. Of course, I'm also old, so my life has been mostly lived. Hmm. Um, Walt is feeling the ambivalence of joy because he's recognizing, you know, being away from his wife, how much she lights it up and how much he wouldn't want to be without that. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, that's that bittersweet, right? That joy together uh, alongside the recognition of, yeah. I mean, there, you know, I, I don't think there's such a thing as, uh, and this is, this is one proposition they made in the book. Uh, there is no joy without some sense of sorrow. Um, I know, I need to like investigate that more. I was like, hmm. Um, but I, I, I like the premise that we don't have to separate them quite so much. Sorry, it's, it's this one. Yeah. 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 So Chogyam Trumpa also, uh, mentioning this kind of, you know, hard won in, in some ways joy or like the, the, the co-occurrence together. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think it is again, like this observation, like how can we find it? So, so curious for folks, how, how is that landing or, or what comes up when we think of that joy amid the difficulty? See some head nodding, yes and no. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm.
Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So Noam is sharing that um, joy can really get flattened when it's transactional. Like, should I have this? Should I not have it? But that definitely there is that um, kind of unbelievable uh, connection between joy and sorrow and describe that when his father was dying or had died, that there was also so much joy because of what an amazing being he was. And uh, though he was suffering, there was still so much joy. Yeah. That's amazing. Because I was, <laughs> no, because I was just thinking about that, you know, imagining like if I saw my mom dying, it would be sad, but at the same time, it would be so so much joy to be able to be there with her and yeah. you know, share her final moments. Wow, hmm. I, I'm, I'm blown away because I, I was just thinking about the same thing. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Claudia. Yeah, Vikram. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. And have you found it, have, if you think back, can you remember feeling it in the moment when you've been through difficulties? Yeah. 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 Uh, so Vikram was saying that, you know, I, I'm looking back on those difficult weeks and remembering the joy of it and yet how much more powerful it can be in that moment to recognize it can be subsumed. But I, I will say, I, um, you know, I, I do definitely try to like practice obviously awareness and emotional awareness. And I have been in the practice probably about a year. It's so, it sounds so lame when I do it, but it's like really been a good practice for me of like, this is a good moment. <laughs> Like I, I say that, like, oh, and it's like, my partner's like, mm, you know, but I'm like, no, no, like, let's like, this is a good moment. And it just really has been helping me too, because it, it, it just names it. And there was a couple times in that hard time where I was like, this is a good moment. You know, the morning after my little fur being, uh, left his, left his body, I went on this unbelievably beautiful hike and definitely felt like just the beauty of, you know, the opposite of what it had meant to cry all those tears. And, uh, you know, we are, it's often said, you know, you, you, you hear um, um, kind of biologists and, and neurologists say that, you know, the, the human brain and, and humans are contrast seeking beings. So there's also just something about that contrast too of, what makes us present or available to what maybe is always there, but in, in the stark relief can be more, uh, more visible to us. Diane, I see your hand again. Yes. Um, Denise shared that, yes, when my mom died and during divorce, I felt as if I had the flu, yet some joy touched me through the fog of sorrow even then. Hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. But I still don't think we're still getting to Mace's point, which I feel like is a really big one, um, deserving of joy. Can I be deserving of joy, right? And, and what does it mean to deserve joy? And I think, I think it's an interesting question from, from the Dharma, you know, point of view, because it's, It almost, it, like, we have to commodify the joy to believe that it's something we get, right? So that's to the transactional. So I wonder if some of it is in, you know, just, um, gosh, I can't remember. Someone might know this, you know, our, our joys are more abundant as we, like, watch them leaving the doors. Some, some poet, um, you know, our, our joy redoubles if we're able to kind of, like kiss it as it leaves, as opposed to try to hold it down next to us. And this idea of, can we, can we have a sense of joy really not being ours, not being mine, 
not being me, but just one part of this huge um, palette of human experiences. So, you know, we, well, I certainly am not there, but could I have no preference between my feelings of frustration, guilt, shame, jealousy, and joy, right? And just be like, they're all not mine, not me, and just coming through. Um, and I love, you know, uh, Pema Chodron writes about this a lot too, of this, as we're feeling joy, dedicating it in that moment, you know, as we did in this practice of, so it, you don't get so sticky with it and don't develop that sense of, oh, this is it. This is that thing. Okay. You know, just immediately letting it go, immediately letting it go. So it doesn't maybe feel as though it's this thing I get specifically that's mine. Um, and, it, you know, in this book, uh, His Holiness does talk about, you know, refugee camps and the time he spent there and how he's un always surprised by the joy, but then not surprised by the joy. And that humans just find their way to that sense of joy, which he attributes to our innate and intrinsic, he says hardwired, because he loves scientific words, our hardwired desire to be of service. And that is the root of our joy. Yeah. Hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah. So Mace is really describing here that um, some of the resistance to joy probably arises from a misunderstanding of joy, um, of course, which capitalism perpetuates because it wants us to constantly be seeking for a state that's impossible, which is sustained joy. Um, and she's describing the movie Inside Out, which I've seen, maybe some of you have seen, and it um, really has joy at the driver's seat in defense of Inside Out when sadness tried to take a hike and disappear, so each of the emotions are different characters, also the whole system fell apart. So there's a, but I, this idea that we should kind of constantly be in a state of joy, I do think that's a, a misnomer. However, I have the sense for His Holiness of Dalai Lama and, and Archbishop Desmond Tutu that some of their spiritual practice has created like a pretty sustained state of like at least okayness, right? Like less neurotic self-absorption, more presence of just kind of natural okay. Um, I want that. <laughs> more of that. I see your hand again, Diane. Is, is there? Well, I just wanted to say... Um... I've been studying the Satipatthana Sutta and um, Bhikkhu Analayo's guidebook and going to a kind of a year-long class with folks and talking about it. And, and joy 
I can totally resonate with, you know, not deserving joy just because I think, you know, having a, you know, my parents um, were pretty um, restrictive and there was not a lot of joy in our home, but mm-hmm. working with joy, um, I have a lot of discursive, you know, karmic conditioned thoughts on in clear knowing. And then it's just a, a cloud of like misery manifests and, or um, the sloth and the talper and joy, mm-hmm. joy is a way to, for me to shift gears. You know, just thinking of something simple, you know, like looking at the sky or, um, gosh, there's this, um, I've been studying to um, be reading uh, The Mind of Clover, um, Aiken mm-hmm. Roshi on the precepts, and he talks about how there's, there's always a spark of something if we can just look at it, you know, and just yes. look for it. So that thing of, you no, know, in the Satipatthana Sutra, there's all these contemplations, but a lot of them are just like, you know, if you start noticing this instead of that, you'll be so much better off. I'm just like kind of, kind of like freestyling here, but just can I notice, can I notice the joy instead of noticing what's, instead of listening to that karmically conditioned voice that pops up whenever I do feel joy, here's a balloon of suffering saying, oh, well, let's look at that and that, because that's just like a habitual pattern, you know, mm. a karmic conditioning process or a nervous system doing all that. Yeah. Wow. I love that teaching you just shared with us. Um, I think it's. I think there's something really powerful um, underneath that, which is the the aspect of choice in joy, right? And that there is this perceptual aspect of are we choosing? Um, and it's not that it's easy, right? It's it's not that it's easy to to choose that. There is a lot of momentum uh, from our fear, from our frustrations, from our sense of lack that could get in the way of seeing things joyfully. And I actually had the same inspiration reading this book. I mean, I, I do often think of His Holiness the Dalai Lama when I need some inspiration for joy. It, it helps and uh, reminds me of this beautiful quote from the late poet John O'Donohue who says, always keep something beautiful in your mind. And I think for him, when he describes beauty, he it, sen- it sounds like uh, a sense of joy. And, you know, how do we hold something kind of joyful in our mind to have that spark um, there with us, something that can really, um, that can really just keep it, keep it going so that the ember can become a flame. Um, yeah. And I it is. This, my yeah, favorite thing. It's not like, it's not like I'm not aware of the suffering of the world and most right. of my life it'd be like, well, there's all this, you know, I can't really be happy till everybody is. But um, when I, I heard a teacher talk about the two arrows. Yeah. So think of maybe the joy is the remedy for the second arrow. So the first arrow is, yeah, you know, my beloved pet passed away. I'm going to be really sad about it. Or I'm for me, like, oh, I'm really lonely. That's the first arrow, just to be with that yeah. sadness or the loneliness. But the second arrow is, well, you know, it's because you did this and that. And if you weren't <laughs> such a blah, 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 you know, that's the second arrow. So for me, the joy is the antidote of the second arrow because it's all it's 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 the cloud. It's not the true clean seeing. And it's just I'm just thinking perhaps it's I think of Mahayana Buddhism as like a martial art. I, you know, I'm training, I'm training my mind to unbother itself. And that's what I consider enlightenment, <laughs> unbothered. It's not like I don't care. It's not like I'm not going to try my yeah. best for everybody, but just that that bother that I cause myself. And I think that makes me a worser person, right? Like I'm a danger to people when I'm driving and I'm lost in thought and around my home. That's when I'm breaking stuff and bumping into stuff is when I'm in this cloud of a historical vignette or you know, reenactments of past failures. Anyway, thank you for listening. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, I, I do think about, you know, what are the kind of what are the enemies of joy or what are the obstacles of joy? And you're mentioning it, that kind of self-related, self-preoccupied criticism, negative thinking. Um, it really gets in the way. And you know, and worry, right? A lot of, I find, I don't know, I am a worry warrior. And just that sense, um, and it's interesting in the book, the Dalai Lama quotes Shanti Deva, who, you know, this famous quote of, um, if I, if there's something wrong and I can do something about it, I will do it. If there's something wrong and I can't, I just won't worry. It's like, all right. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but I, you know, 
I do think it is um, it is really tough to not get caught in that kind of really contracted self-referential way of being with a lot of the worries in our world and <clears throat> they're very real and they're very true and I would never want us to you know completely bypass the trueness and realness of our own and others struggle and suffering with joy right and so it's a it's an interesting balance there of of how we invite it and again I had a little resistance to this rebranding of joy I'm like can we just be happy like is that okay like what's up with the joy but there's such an effervescence to that word or at least my my like relationship to it it does feel um like a bit more of a radical act um I think I've really started to feel like this that happiness is um is contentment that that has a real resonance to me so this joy feels really um feels like a more honestly intentional um and effortful approach and i think as you're describing diane it's like how do we unclutter how do we um in some ways like yeah refine i love this idea of a martial art like how do we refine our movements with more precision in the mind so that it can incline towards joy? Like it's, um, it's not something that necessarily will happen on its own. A lot of us have a lot of uh, energy and momentum that has directed us the other way. Um, yeah, I, I would say another thing that I notice that can really get in the way of joy um, not only is the worry, but it's like the blame, right, of this world and this place and that person. And those that really like just feel so strongly to me of wanting to control things and uh, wanting to have a sense of, again, that I as a separate entity can really effortfully um, impose my will on others. And not that we just lay down and let anything happen, but how can we meet life um, as life is offering itself to us and with joy um, really is amazing. And you, you hear, and again, I was, I was suggesting this with my own experience, but you hear these teachings of, you know, these, this great amount of difficulty and, and struggle and suffering will lead to compassion. That seems clear. So is there then like a bridge to joy also? Like is, I was really curious about that kind of, not that everything needs to be joy, but it's an interesting investigation. I know that you can have a kind of joy from feeling compassion, that sense of connection and heartfelt care for others. Um, yeah, so I was a bit won over. Any other thoughts or questions on this idea of um, some ways moving towards joy? Yeah. Yes. Beautiful. Yeah. So he's describing that, you know, this fabricated culture of scarcity that we live in can make it feel as though maybe my joy would threaten your joy or get in the way or impose. And in fact, it just complements. Um, and it's true and, and also described in that, that, you know, and Diane was saying, I'm, when I'm more joyful, I'm a better driver. But we're a better like sister, parent, colleague, coworker. And um, it's not to mean that you're you know, it's interesting, I, I think I've mentioned this before in the Sangha, but there's been some good research that when we have very strong, positive emotions, we are actually less intelligent. Um, not forever, that's not an enduring trait, but while we're in the kind of grip of our bliss, we're just like less discerning. And I'm like, that kind of makes sense, you know, in the same way that when we're, you know, caught in the grip of our anger, we're really narrowed and focused on that which makes us angry. And then when we're feeling joyful, there's actually this more diffuse mindset. Uh, it actually is good at seeing connections, there's creativity, but we're not like as sharp. Um, and so we don't want to have the kind of joy where we're just like checked out 
or harming someone. Um, and so I think, again, what's interesting in this book, and I'm already feeling into it, is uh, there's an ethics implicit in this joy. You know, there's an ethics of this is not harming. Um, this is actually for the benefit of all beings. This is a choice that I make with intention. Um, so what I'd, I'd, I'd love if you guys would help me with my homework. Um, if you have any questions that you'd be curious. So some of you may know Sukhni Rinpoche, just super lovely teacher. Uh, we did book study with his, his book, Open Heart, Open Mind. And um, I get to do this little moderated session with him on Friday um, around this book. So I've come up with my own kind of musings, but what would you like to ask Sokni about how to cultivate joy or questions about joy <clears throat> from someone who is a, uh, you know, Rinpoche incarnate master whose brother is Minga Rinpoche and Chokinima Rinpoche. And he's just an incredible being who swims in this and yet totally gets uh, contemporary neuroses of the modern mind. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So uh, Mesa asks, I'm really glad I don't have to answer it because I'm going to ask Sophie about it. <laughs> How can we balance, you know, this sense of, um, you know, we're having a nice meal and we're, you know, connecting to the fact that that meal will fuel us to do the good in the world. And yet that meal was brought, you know, from factory farms on fossil fuel. Like, how do we actually kind of hold um, being ethical and non-harming while trying to experience joy, like recognizing that literally everything we do causes harm. Yeah. 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 Right. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I like Noam Jams. We'll see if he does as well. <laughs> so the idea of, um, you know, even amid all these difficulties of um, being transact or sorry, being uh, extractive, actually, as being Americans and we are over consuming by default, isn't it still better that we're joyful amid that and that we can be a joyful being who's radiating that as a possible solution? And you know, I'm just curious about that transactional piece, like how do we work with our sense of joy um, without it feeling like I put this in, I get that out, right? Yeah. Well, no, I mean, one of my 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so he's saying that we can't really just pull the joy out, um, you know, remove from the other practices, you know, the four measurables and sila and how we're engaging with, because we could be on retreat in a sense of rapture and joy and then just tank um, in our next sitting. That's like, they call it the corpses of our former practice laying around us. Um, Diane, I see a hand there. Yeah, I just wanted to catch up on the chat and a couple of questions. And just want to point out the Satipatthana has joy as a factor of awakening. And it's a bunch of things that you can use to uh, get back to mindfulness. And I thought of one thing before I read the chats. We have two pillars who come to every well of being and they're wonderful people. And one of them went through a real hardship. And I had never heard this phrase before, but I have it on my bathroom mirror, which is a great place you can write in dry erase and you'll see it for a real long time. I wrote, um, welcome everything. And maybe that's a gateway you know, that's a gateway to joy. Mm. And not joy is like, I'm just superficially happy and I'm just an imbecile, not paying attention to anything, but joy is a, as a, um, a way to get myself back to the present and to appreciate and the practice of gratitude. So sorry, I'm going to catch up on the chats. Walt wrote, sometimes I engage in optimistic pessimism, hope for the best, expect the worst. And if things turn out better than expected, you can be relieved, albeit not joyful. And I wanted mm. to ask um, to, if you would give us the name of the book, and then Denise wanted to know if we can listen to your interview Friday. So yeah. Name a book. Um, yes. The book is The Book of Joy. <laughs> I actually think we should do a Dharma Collective screening of the documentary that was made. Because um, now we have a screen. And we could do a little Q&A and a popcorn or chips. I love that sounds joyful. Um, so they did a documentary. This was a four day meeting. It was, I think about five years ago and they wrote the book. They did this, um, documentary and then they've launched this adventure called mission joy. And so the conference is being co-produced by mission joy and the mind and life Institute. Um, and so it's recorded, it'll be recorded this Friday, but it actually won't be released until November. Um, so that, and when it is released, we should do a viewing party here. It'll be a free summit. There's amazing speakers, um, including Adrian Marie Brown. For those of you, that's come up a lot in the Sangha. It's just a really cool group of folks talking about joy um, and connecting on it. So yeah, that will be that. And sorry, was there one more question in there or no? Did I miss it? Till November, but the documentary, which is freely available on YouTube, and I have a still haven't seen yet. Uh, yeah, I think it would be really fun to watch. It seems the book is really beautiful. So how can how can we watch your interview this Friday? It won't be till November. Oh, the Sad. interview. I, oh, I see. Okay, I'm sorry. No, they're delaying. They're like gathering all their things and then later. So yeah. They haven't announced the date yet, of, uh, but it's going to be the Summit of Joy. Okay. Sounds Thank encouraging. You. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. I will tell um, Sokni um, hello from all of you. Such a, a sweet honor to, to connect with him. And yeah, that I really appreciate your reflections. So let's take a moment here. Dedicate Merit. So following the next breath as a way to re-enter this inner world of body and breath. Notice if anything has shifted or changed in your body since we sat together at the beginning of our time. Maybe sensations have moved around or become more diffuse or stronger.
I'm taking a moment here to consider if any of our conversation and reflection, of our practice of considering joy has had any impact on us that we could imagine that benefit radiating out, becoming stronger and clearer and greater through our body, our speech, our mind, all of our actions in the world. And dedicating our practice that it could be in service so that all beings would connect with joy, would know ease, would feel freedom and safety, that all beings would be free. Thank you all. I'm so much more joyful than when I got here. Really appreciate that opportunity. 